They robbed him, kidnapped him, and some they murdered. This changed the dynamic between John and Eileen in a tremendous way. Because now, Eileen is all in at the highest level. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who commit heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. The second born to teenage parents, Kayla Dixon knows the meaning of hard knocks better than anyone in the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia. Her mom worked to support the family, but because there just wasn't a lot of money coming into the household, that led to a good deal of instability in her childhood. This is what I was looking for! You got to... So Kayla was always searching for someone to give her attention, to show they cared about her. Though the neighborhoods their meager income affords them are infected with crime, the 12-year-old manages to feed that hunger in other ways. She was doing good in school, getting fairly good grades. She was involved in her church. Two years later, the longing is so brutal that the now high school freshman falls into the adolescent arms of 16-year-old Darius Sharp. And so she gets involved with a young man who really kind of becomes the center of her world. When he smoked, she smoked. And when he cut school, she cut school. When someone has a lack of role models in their lives, it becomes very easy for them to choose a particular person that they now want to be able to imitate or what they see as being successful or being cool. Within a few months, she finds herself following in her young parents' footsteps when she becomes pregnant at 14. Kayla eventually had a child with this person. It was another complicating factor in her already complicated life. By the time she's 16, the father of her daughter is long gone, leaving the young mom to care for her toddler on her own, barely scraping by. Life for Kayla was tough. Um, she was raising this child. She was still in the household with her parents. Her sister also had two children. She didn't have much money to go anywhere. She didn't have a job, and she didn't have any support from her family. So all she did was go to school online and raise her child. After a grueling school year, Kayla welcomes summer break with open arms. And love is in the hot Georgia air when she starts dating a man she meets online, 20-year-old Nathaniel Vivian. He works part-time at a grocery store. He likes to play video games. He had his own place. He was stable in a way that Kayla wasn't. Nathaniel represented a lot of positive things. He accepted her, gave her attention. The relationship quickly gets serious when her new guy reveals his soft spot for little ones. He seems to embrace the fact that she has a daughter. So she is allowed to sort of date and interact with him and also, you know, include her daughter in that. Over the next two months, the young lovers are inseparable. But Kayla's happiness is eclipsed when tensions at home hit a breaking point. There was one evening where she was doing the dishes. Her father comes in. They began to argue about the finances, the living conditions, and it just escalated from there. And in the course of that ordeal, Kayla's father told her that she could either essentially get with the program or get out. And she opted to get out. Otherwise empty-handed, the teen grabs her child and walks out the door, never to return. She has essentially no family to go to. She is completely on her own. Desperate, the 16-year-old runs to the only safe place she knows. At that point, Kayla calls Nathaniel and he welcomes in her and her daughter. But within weeks, their distressful reality sets in. Kayla and Nathaniel's situation becomes more and more desperate. There's no additional money coming into the house. Nathaniel's paying for Kayla and the baby to eat. He's paying for their housing, and things become financially desperate. When a person now begins to depend on someone else completely, it now becomes easier for them to just follow whatever the mandates or dictates of that other person is. By the end of the month, they've burned through every dollar before paying his landlord, forcing the man of the house to act fast to take care of his instant family. In order to make the rent and to pay his bills, Nathaniel decides to sell his game console. It was a big sacrifice because it was something he 
enjoyed using. The weight of the situation comes down hard on the devoted girlfriend. Kayla definitely viewed that as something that she needed to rectify. She wanted to prove herself. She wanted to show her commitment to the relationship. Guilt is a very powerful motivator and will eventually be the impetus for someone to do something, maybe something extreme, in order to make up for what they felt they did wrong in the first place. Soon, Kayla gets her chance to take action. But her drive to appease her man becomes reckless when she's confronted with a deadly decision to make. Nathaniel gives Kayla a gun and tells her to hold on to it. Nathaniel knew he had control. She would do anything he had asked of her. ...is out to replace his video game console after he sold his own to support them. He decided that he was going to rob someone else of their game console, and he asked Kayla to help him. Rob someone. Kayla agreed, I'm sure, to go along with this because she felt responsible for Nathaniel losing the game console that he had. And she felt beholden to Nathaniel for the fact that he was taking care of her. Sure. The fear of losing someone may cause a person to do something they wouldn't do in the first place. But the illicit plan doesn't come naturally to the untrained schemers. Kayla and Nathaniel had no experience committing previous crimes. They sort of turned to the internet for the how-to for completing this crime. And so Kayla and Nathaniel, after doing all this online research, would text each other back and forth about the plan and what they found. Next, they hunt for their prey. So once Kayla and Nathaniel felt prepared to commit the perfect robbery, they then went to a buy and sell website where they began to look at sellers of the gaming console that Nathaniel wanted. And that's where they find the ideal target, 28-year-old Daniel Zeitz. Daniel is a very well-respected and known gamer in the gaming community, and he had the exact console that Nathaniel wanted. He was asking $280 for the video gaming console. Determined to attract the gamer's undivided attention, Nathaniel responds to Daniel's post in an email, telling him exactly what he wants to hear. He didn't attempt to negotiate, but told Daniel that he would accept his very first selling price. Nathaniel made arrangements with Daniel to meet outside of his apartment complex to purchase the gaming console. With the plan on lock, the 16-year-old is ready to help her boyfriend rob the seller blind. It's after 9 p.m. on a Friday in September when Nathaniel puts his gun in the glove compartment in preparation to meet Daniel. Everything's ready to go except for one small complication. Kayla has nowhere to take her daughter, so she and Nathaniel actually put her into the car at their apartment complex and set off together, the three of them, to go and rob Daniel. Nathaniel is driving. Kayla is sitting in the passenger seat. Her baby is actually in the back seat of the car. Bringing your own child into the middle of an illegal action or dangerous situation, I believe may speak volumes about the mother in that she didn't realize how dangerous of a situation it was in the first place. The family drives 15 miles to the apartment in Sandy Springs, where Daniel is set to meet them at any second. While waiting, they make their final preparation. Nathaniel owned a gun legally, and the plan was to use that gun to scare the victim into complying with their request. Nathaniel gives Kayla his gun, and she puts it in between her legs and has it ready to use if the need arises. As if on cue, Daniel appears with the goods. Daniel walks up to the driver's side and shows Nathaniel the gaming console. At that point, Nathaniel attempts to grab the gaming console out of Daniel's hands. But the aggressive move is unexpectedly matched. Daniel was going to keep his property at all costs. He was not going to let go. The vicious tug of war takes Kayla by surprise. Kayla sees the struggle between Nathaniel and Daniel, and it's a pretty violent struggle. They are really sort of going at it. As they were struggling for the gaming console, Kayla begins to panic. The 16-year-old clutches the gun in her lap and quickly points it toward the action, pulling the trigger. She struck Nathaniel in the hand, 
and then the bullet went through Nathaniel's hand and then entered into the side of Daniel's chest. The 28-year-old falls to the ground, while the couple frantically speeds away with the game system. At this point, neither Kalo or Nathaniel knew Daniel's status. They knew he had been shot, but they did not know whether he was alive or dead. When someone is in panic mode, it becomes real difficult for them to make rational decisions because at that moment, they are in absolute panic mode. Inside the speeding car, the bloodbath continues. Her daughter's in the back seat. Nathaniel's bleeding all over the place, so it just had to have been crazy. When someone you love is hurt, what happens is the adrenaline is released into your system. You are into fight or flight in regard to your responses, and you're not thinking about anything other than pure survival. The escaped killers hightail it to an emergency room 10 minutes away in Brookhaven, where Nathaniel's gunshot wound comes into question. Authorities want to know how did Nathaniel get shot. Kayla and Nathaniel crafted a story that they were robbed by some people in an apartment complex, and Kayla shot the assailants to defend her boyfriend. The police checked to see whether or not there had been any reports of shots fired in that area, and of course there had not been. Meanwhile, Sandy Springs police officers are dispatched to the apartment building parking lot after a neighbor heard the late night shot. But 28-year-old Daniel Zeitz has already met his fate. When authorities arrived on the scene, they saw Daniel's body and his gunshot wound, and Daniel was pronounced dead on arrival. Daniel's family suffered a horrific, unimaginable, tremendous loss. Daniel was loved. He was a beloved son and friend. He was well known in those communities as just somebody really happy, someone who they were all going to miss. The tragedy instantly turns into a murder investigation. But the night is far from meeting its bitter end when Kayla is faced with yet another painful decision to make. The stories just did not match up. And communication between the Sandy Springs Police Department and the Brookhaven Police Department led them to investigate these two crimes together. She was willing to do too much in order to hold on to a love that really wasn't love. And later, there's no end to the devastation in West Covina, California, once Eileen Huber falls for a man who thirsts for violence. They went from doing smaller crimes to now committing the most serious of all crimes. Eileen realized that he would do anything for her. Well, it made it easy for her to do anything for him. There's an eerie chill in Georgia after Kayla Dixon and her boyfriend flee a homicide scene before Sandy Springs police arrive. They immediately start to investigate, to try to figure out what happened, and to process all of the evidence at the crime scene. And um, at the same time, Nathaniel and Kayla were having to report their crime to the Brookhaven Police Department. Once homicide detectives get wind of a gunshot wound being treated at a nearby emergency room, they follow the lead to the hospital to question the patient and his girl. It was like three or four. They pull out the gun, and like my first instinct was to grab it out the glove compartment, and I think I pulled the trigger. The 16-year-old denies that she and her man had anything to do with Daniel's death but experienced investigators don't buy it. She was playing around with it in the car, like flicking the trigger. I didn't personally see because I was driving, and then it just went off. Kayla and Nathaniel told different stories. They appeared to be confused, and the stories kept changing. They had no contingency plan for if the crime went wrong, what would the story be? So everything crumbled at that time. Kayla's steadfast loyalty to her boyfriend hits a dead end. We went to this guy's house, and um, they got all the parts, and I just pulled the trigger and shot him. And then I got a gun. I was like, okay, I'm going to shoot him. I don't know. I think I shot the guy. They confessed that they had agreed to meet him there for the purchase of a game console with the intent to rob him. And Kayla actually confessed to her role and told the police that she was the one who shot Daniel. As she surrenders her innocence, 
Her daughter is torn away from her while she and Nathaniel are arrested. For Kayla, because of the nature of the charges, her very harsh reality was that she was going to be charged and prosecuted as an adult, even though she was only 16 years old. It's really unbelievable. Other 16-year-olds are worrying about a prom dress or, you know, who likes me on social media. And Kayla's faced with um, the ramifications of this horrific crime that she committed and how that will impact not just herself, but also her daughter. The young mom and her 20-year-old boyfriend are charged with murder and aggravated assault, facing life in prison. A year and a half later, on what's to be the first day of Kayla's trial, the now 18-year-old suddenly chooses to accept a plea deal, agreeing to testify against Nathaniel. She decided that she had to start looking out for herself, um, that she could not continue to put Nathaniel before herself anymore. Her life was literally on the line. It's really difficult to turn on that person that you have protected and loved in the past. At her sentencing hearing, Kayla prepares for the moment she's been waiting for since the night she pulled the trigger. Kayla had a chance in court to say a statement to Daniel's family, and it was heartfelt. It was filled with regret, and it didn't pass any blame on to anyone. She owned up to her mistakes, and it's heartbreaking to see, you know, that moment of what those actions um, do and, and look into the family's faces of uh, the victims. Kayla Dixon is sentenced to 40 years in prison for voluntary manslaughter, robbery, possession of a firearm during a felony, and concealing the death of another. A few weeks later, a jury convicts Nathaniel Vivian and sentences him to life behind bars. Though their deadly union is now severed, the painful loss of that fateful night is undying. This case was a tale of two tragedies. It was the tragedy of Kayla losing many good years of her life under the influence of a man, and it was also the tragedy of an innocent person, Daniel, losing his life over a gaming console. Her whole life, she really had been searching for someone to love her and fill that gap in her life, and part of that search for love made her do things for a man who she thought loved her. Kayla Dixon's desperation for love became something she would kill for. Next, in San Gabriel Valley, California, Eileen Huber helps her man feed his perverse appetite for crime. Growing up, Eileen's life seems right in line with her Baldwin Park, California neighbors. She had a two-parent household. Uh, everything was good for her. The future looked very bright. She was a model child. She was happy all the time, friendly, a little angel. But behind the white picket fence, the nine-year-old's life is anything but perfect when her parents separate. Her mother leaves, and that's when the family changes. She has to be raised by the father, and from what we can tell, he did the best he could. But her abandoned heart needs more than her single dad is able to give. He was a workaholic. He stayed constantly at work, and she was left to do household chores and run the home. When a child has been abandoned by one or even both parents, uh, it's something that is quite confusing, and that separation may leave that child very confused, very angry, very sad. Over the next few years, the teen looks beyond her empty home to fill the void in her life. She hung out with girls that were in gangs. She was steadily progressing down that path. <laughs> When a teenager believes that no one cares about him or her, it's not unusual for them to act out because they are dealing with a mix of very confused feelings. As the months go on, Eileen wards off loneliness with her rebellious friends, making school the last thing on the 10th grader's mind. Her grades declined. She could do the work. She just did not do the work. There were really no adults even there to try to send Eileen a lifeline to kind of pull her in. And by the time her dad finds out that she's failing her classes, it's too late. Eileen finally just dropped out of school. She had no motivation to be there any longer. She 
had become too far behind in her classes to do anything at that point. Sometimes, when a child feels that no one cares about them, they'll begin to neglect themselves. Because of that lack of love, they will begin to not love themselves. But after a drug intervention, her dad holds out hope that his daughter isn't a lost cause. I mean, you've got to get it together. I know. He bought her a car. I got your car. And encouraged her to get her GED, and he helped her with gas. You can do this. Before long, her narrow routine begins to swerve when she runs into a former classmate, 17-year-old John Lewis. Eileen remembered that John had a lot of trouble in school. <laughs> you too. John was always in trouble, always fighting, being arrested, even as a juvenile. But there's something about the underdog that lures Eileen in. John was very charismatic, and he was very handsome. He had no trouble getting any woman that he wanted. As the two catch up, Eileen learns that nothing has changed for him since their younger years. John was involved in a gang. He's using drugs. Clearly, uh, if there's a definition for a bad boy, uh, John Lewis fits it. That's, that's what he's all about. And it's quite common for people to be attracted to that kind of personality, somebody that lives on the edge, etc. After spending more time together, she's undeniably attracted to the thrill seeker but soon proving her worth in his wild escapade is a deadly charge she's willing to take john had such tremendous influence over eileen that if he said jump her response would be how high after running into her former classmate in baldwin park california eileen huber can't help but relate to the individual hiding under the rough exterior growing up John had a very, very rough childhood. He went out into the street and sort of found some connection there with this gang that he gets involved with. But their budding friendship suddenly comes to a halt when he's arrested for assault with a deadly weapon and burglary and thrown into juvie. Over the next two years, Eileen has trouble getting back in the grind while still living under her dad's roof. If someone has not been able to successfully navigate through some of the maturational phases in life, it becomes easy for them to get stuck in a certain rut, and therefore, they're not motivated to move forward. The 20-year-old endures the loneliness until the one who got away re-enters her life. When John gets out of the Youth Authority when he turns 21, he hooks right back up with uh, Eileen, and they're off. This was someone that actually showed attention to her. While she had been alone, kind of you know, trying to figure it and map it all out, here's John was present. As her reignited flame quickly becomes the center of her world, Eileen moves in with him and his loyal crew. John lived in that apartment along with his half-sister, Robin Machucha, her boyfriend, Vincent Hubbard, Eileen, and Robin's six-year-old daughter. Like John, they're no strangers to the fast life. Robin also had criminal record for burglary. Vincent also had violence in his background, as well as drug use. So here we are at this apartment where everyone's got a criminal record, except for Eileen. She's the odd person out. Eileen settles in quickly with the proud misfits, who do everything but work. They spent as much time as they could gathering money in any way that they could, going back to the apartment and getting drunk, smoking pot, doing crack, doing some heroin. Without her father's rules overhead, proving herself game to her man's lifestyle is easy for the user. So Eileen steps up for drug and alcohol use uh, as time goes on, as, as a matter of influence by John, Benson, and Robin. They were a very close-knit group. She wanted part of that. She wanted to do whatever she had to do to be part of that. When someone is so desperate to fit in with a certain group, they will adapt to that environment, take on the behaviors of that group in order to fit in. Just days later, after the foursome spends their Independence Day weekend burning through their stash, John is ready for action. John, with his raging hatred of society, he wanted to kill people. He wanted to exact his revenge on the rest of the world that, in his eyes, was doing so much better than he was. I gotta figure something out. The following night, three hours after sunset, 
her scheming boyfriend rides shotgun as Eileen drives them into the night. John was on with a, a sawed-off shotgun, and they were looking for a nice-looking car. And the plan was to bump the car so that it would stop, and John would go up, and he would rob the individual who was driving. They take a ride to the neighboring city of Monrovia, where John catches sight of 22-year-old Jose Avina in a shiny new truck, seemingly ripe for the taking. And when they came to a stoplight, he instructed her to hit it hard enough where the driver would stop. And Eileen makes impact with this other car, drives right into it. So Eileen watched John get out of the passenger side of the car and walk up to Jose's car. Get out the car. No, get out the car. We're getting his car. After 10 p.m. in the quiet foothills of California's San Gabriel Mountains, Eileen Huber and her boyfriend are trying to carjack a stranger's truck. Eileen is sitting there, still in the driver's side of the car, watching John, not knowing what's coming next. He tried to drive away. At that point, John just acted, and he just shot Jose in the head, killing him instantly. John threw Jose's body out of the car, jumped into the driver's seat of Jose's car and drove off with Eileen following him. Before abandoning the stolen vehicle, they make off with the truck's stereo and flip it into drug money. Jose's body is found a short time later, but the sheriff's efforts to find Eileen and her man are fruitless as the Slayer and his girl tuck themselves away in bed. But it's a restless night for Jose's fiance, who's flooded with the tragic news that her husband-to-be is dead and no one is in custody. There was really nothing, no leads to lead the police back to who actually did this. All they have is Jose's body, and later on, they find a car abandoned with the stereo gone. There's nothing to really connect John and Eileen to this murder. Bound by bloodshed, Eileen is more connected to John than ever before. This changed the dynamic between John and Eileen in a tremendous way, because now Eileen is all in at the highest level. She's witnessed her man go out and commit a murder. When two people commit a horrible crime, it now brings them even closer because they have a deep, dark secret that they're sharing together. But the benefits the four roommates reap from the carjacking doesn't fuel their party for long. And as the pack leader plots the next gainful heist, his 20-year-old accomplice is game to feed into it. They only had the one sort of shotgun. They needed more weapons, more guns to help with the offenses. That's where Eileen came in. Eileen told everyone that her father was a gun collector. My dad has a lot of guns. She's talking my language now. She really wanted to prove her, her spot in this foursome, so she offered her father's home and guns up for their next robbery. The eager girlfriend does her part by taking her dad on an overnight trip to Pismo Beach. And that's when Eileen seized on the opportunity to burglarize the residence. So John breaks into Eileen's dad's house and steals a multitude of guns from that house. When Gary returns the next day, he's alarmed to find his home ransacked. He calls the police and reports the robbery, having no idea he is an unwitting pawn. Over the next 10 days, John, Vincent, and Robin use the stolen arms to target innocent mall goers just a mile away from their apartment where Eileen waits. They just chose people that they thought they could surprise and they robbed them, kidnapped them, and some they murdered. Somebody always had to stay back and basically act as the babysitter and that task fell to Eileen. Now, in exchange for that, Eileen gives them the keys to her car and they use the car to go off and commit these crimes. The horror is just beginning after her boyfriend sets his sights on more than just cash, when they come across 49-year-old Elizabeth Nisbet. Elizabeth ended up at the mall with her husband, who had gone inside to pay a bill, and she remained in the car just waiting for him. And she had a, a very nice wedding ring. But it's about to attract the wrong person. John came up and knocked on the, the window. She opened the door, and he had a gun. So they kidnapped Elizabeth from the mall. They shoot her and leave her. 
And before he left, he took everything that she had on her and everything of value in the car. And one of those things was her wedding ring and engagement ring. The same day Elizabeth's husband loses his wife to a tragic death, the killer uses the very jewel that marked their love to propose to Eileen. Mere thought of taking a dead woman's wedding ring and recommissioning that to your bride-to-be is the most vile, brutal thing I can think of. People who are on drugs, quite often they are anesthetizing themselves against their own pain. So between the drugs and the criminal acting out, there's not really a consideration for the pain that is being inflicted on others. Three days after pledging his love with the blood diamond, Eileen drives her ringleader boyfriend and the crew in her car on another quest for cash. Once they arrive at their usual hunting spot, they target 56-year-old beloved wife, Shirley Dunnigan. Shirley had just gotten married, and she had a grandchild, and uh, she was looking forward to her daughter's wedding, I believe. And when she enters her car, John and Vincent approach with their weapons, Get the car. force their way into the car. And he forced her to not only give her her bank card, but the passcode as well. Terrified, Shirley takes her one chance at survival by granting their request. But her captors aren't yet ready to see her go. They bind Shirley's hands in front of her so she's not able to use her hands. Next, they make their way to the nearest cash machine with Robin and Eileen tailing behind. Now, you could only withdraw a certain amount of money from your ATM. So Eileen gets $500, and that's the most that they can get out of the ATM that day. Now that the business with their prisoner is over, they keep her tied up in the car as the four of them discuss Shirley's fate. John pulled over on the side of the road and marched Shirley down an embankment. Please, please! In West Covina, California, Eileen Huber stands beside her man as he heedlessly holds the life of 56-year-old Shirley Dunnigan in his hands. She was brave. She fought. She begged. But if they knew that she could identify all of them. In a split second, her well-traveled and beloved life comes to an end. The group coldly assembles in Eileen's car, and she quickly drives them away. But after Shirley's body is found, authorities trace her bank card activity to every ATM Eileen hit with the stolen pin. One of the significant breaks in the case came with uh, Eileen's picture that shows up on the ATM card machine. That gave us the first snapshot, so to speak, into who these suspects were. It's a female white in her 20s. But with no criminal record, Eileen's grainy image doesn't match their list of usual suspects. But when one of the cameras revealed John, Vincent, and Robin, they hit pay dirt. So they went to the West Covina Police Department said, hey, does anyone know people that look like this or know this car? And it was luck. They said, yeah, these people are being evicted from this apartment. So we got a break knowing now where these suspects lived. An expedited search warrant accompanies detectives and a SWAT team over to the apartment building where Eileen lives with John, Robin, and Vincent. It's 2 o'clock in the morning as the team waits in the parking lot to make their move. Eileen leaves to go to a fast food restaurant. They had been partying all night. She was drunk, she was high. When the officers see Eileen, the SWAT team takes her down. No one inside the unit hears a thing while she's arrested and transported to the sheriff's department for questioning, where haunting evidence is in clear sight. She's wearing Elizabeth's wedding ring and they know they got the right person now. John's hold on her is suddenly broken as the truth opens the floodgates. That's when she told us the whole story about how it happened from beginning to end. Her involvement in using her car, the chase car. And she, in fact, implicated John in all of the murders and crimes and actually admitted her own involvement as well. Eileen said she was afraid of being shot by John. Whether he would have done it or not, I think she was fiercely loyal to him, but still had that fear that he could potentially kill her. Her explanation for the bloodshed is cast aside as she's charged with murder, robbery, and kidnapping. Before her questioning is over, she warns police to be prepared for her boyfriend's stolen gun supply. 
that he won't hesitate to use on them. Braced for the worst, the SWAT team breaks down the front door. Upon entering the apartment, they found John, Robin, and Vincent asleep, and they arrested all of them without incident. Their harrowing crime spree is over, as well as their freedom. In the hot seat, the leader of the pack 